And this was a musical composition by David for the choir director, a hymn arranged to the tune of the wine press treader's song. I love this in the Hebrew, the Gittith. That is, when the harvest came and the grapes were brought in from the fields and they were put in those vats, you had those people who had to get in there Remember the old I Love Lucy? and Get in there and start smashing the grapes with your feet. Now, to keep the rhythm going, one of the attributes of man is that he's a singing man, a singing woman, the, the, the rhythm of it. So as they're treading out the grapes, guess what? They're developed various songs that they would sing, that they would keep away the boredom, they would keep together smashing... And here David happened to hear one of the tunes used by the grape treaders. And he said, you know, I'm going to take that tune and I'm going to put some godly words to it. And down throughout history, you see, there's always been those who do contemporary music by taking the melodies, things of that nature, and then putting good words to them. The Reformation did that. We do it today. Chariots of Fire has had ended up being a hymn. So that what you have is a musical composition, and you will notice, for example, verse 1 and verse 9 is exactly the same in the Hebrew as well as in the English. O Lord, our Lord. Now you look at that first letter, O, O. Whenever you see O, oh, think of soul. Soul. O. Oh. It's not O. Oh. O. Oh. It's O. Oh. It's supposed to resonate in the soul. It means that this hymn comes out of the depths, the matrix of the deepest emotions in the heart of the psalmist. He says, O. Oh. He said, everything that is within me is expressing these words. This isn't a cheap song. It isn't a ditty. This is, oh, and you've got to learn to read that the right way. When you're reading the Psalms, you see, oh, say, oh, until you hear it. And when you do, oh, say that with me and feel it in your chest. Oh, you feel that in the chest. You feel that in the chest. This is how you're to experience this psalm. Oh, and then now Yahweh. Y-H-W-H. Oh, Lord, our Lord. The focus of this psalm is messianic. That is, it has primarily in focus not only the worship of God, not only the worshipers of God, but also the fact that this passage, this psalm, is applied to the Lord Jesus Christ throughout the New Testament in a very unique way. Thus, for example, in the Gospels in Matthew 21 and verse 16, where verse 2 of Psalm 8 says, Out of the mouths of children and babes you have established a fortress of strength. There, in Matthew 21 and verse 16, this is applied to the Lord Jesus Christ. Or again, in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 27, Ephesians 1, verse 22, and even Hebrews 2, 6 through 8, where it is quoted in great extent, we find that portions of this psalm are applied directly to the person and work of Yeshua HaMashiach Baruch Hashem, to the Lord Jesus Christ. Some commentaries have, of course, attacked this and said the New Testament authors were in error. If you read Psalm 8 just as Psalm 8, you would never possibly come up with Jesus. But, of course, they've got it backwards. The New Testament interprets the Old Testament. 
under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, we find what the Holy Spirit was actually saying in these psalms. So when the psalmist said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In Psalm 22 and verse 1, he did not understand that he was mouthing the very words that the Messiah would gasp on the cross, but that was messianic in import as well. The basic theme of the psalm itself is the majesty of God and the dignity of man. I want to read this psalm now in its entirety. O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. The heavens above display your glory. Out of the mouths of children and babies, you have established a fortress of strength because of your enemies to silence every enemy and vengeful foe. When I look up to the heavens, to the works of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you established, what is mortal man that you would take notice of his existence? or the Son of Man, that you should visit him. Although you made him less than divine, you crowned him with glory and honor. You gave dominion over the works of your hands. You put all things under his feet, sheep and cattle, all of them, wild creatures of the field, birds in the air above, fish in the ocean below, all that swims in the currents in the oceans. Oh, Lord, my Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. In terms of the structure of this psalm, the psalm begins and ends with the same words which emphasize the majesty of God. Man has dignity, according to this psalm, only in the context of the majesty of God. The word man has meaning as long as the word God has meaning. Thus you see in the Christian world and life view, the biblical view, there's God, then there are angels, then there's man, then there are animals and plants and things. This is the universe in which we live. This is our world and life view. But when the humanist comes along and says God is dead and he X's out God, well, once God is gone, why are we talking about angels? The very concept of angels would bring us back to God. So we have to get rid of angels. So we've gotten rid of God. We've gotten rid of angels, good and bad. Now we have man, animals, plants, and things. But then why is man listed as a separate category from animals? Well, that must be a mistake, you see, because man is only an animal. It is only because in reference to God that man was separated and when we talk about anthropology, that's a biblical ripoff. So if you go to universities today, they will tell you, if you dare to take a course in anthropology, that the title of this course is erroneous. Actually, we're in zoology. Zoology. And when we discuss Homo sapiens, we're discussing that which evolved out of ooze and one day will ooze back into ooze. And it's really from the ooze through the goo through the zoo to you. And it's zoology. So man is now dead. You can't talk about mankind and human rights and civil rights and women's rights. You can't talk about man as if there is such a thing as man. You can't talk about animals plants and things. But why are we making a distinction between animals and plants? Well, the book of Proverbs says the righteous are kind to animals and the wicked are cruel. Well, it's, you see, because of the biblical teaching that we learned that animals are to be treated in a certain way. 
Thus, if you are a Christian, don't you dare go out and skin a cat and laugh as it runs around without its skin. Don't you dare torture and maim animals. That is not godly. It is not righteous. Yes, you may follow the commandment to rise, kill, and eat, particularly if you can cook them good because they have a right to be roasted, fried, baked, or steamed. But let me tell you, you have no right to torture. But you see, the humanist says, well, we should make any distinction between animals and plants. Matter of fact, when we get finished, there's nothing but things. Things. Thus, all we have in the universe are valueless things that are worthless and have no significance and no meaning. But you see, this means the word man has meaning as long as the word God has meaning. B.F. Skinner of Harvard is a perfect example. He wrote a book, Beyond Freedom and Dignity. Why are we even talking about human freedom? Why do we even discuss human dignity? There is no dignity. There is no freedom. There is really no humanity. That's why civil rights is one of the biggest rip-offs from the liberal perspective. If you're a liberal theologian, you don't really believe in civil rights because you don't believe in rights. You believe in abortion? That baby has no right to live. Kill the baby. It's in the way. You believe in mercy killing? I'm going to have mercy on that person over there in the wheelchair and put them out of their misery. Of course, they're hollering, saying they're doing just fine. I'm going to put you out of your misery. And now they want to get after the elderly and says, well, you, we, we're going to put you out because you're no longer living a life in which you're producing So. How can a liberal or humanist actually believe in human rights? They can't. But in order to retain power, political, I believe in civil rights. No, you don't, hypocrite. Does the baby have any rights? No. The physically or mentally challenged? No, they ain't got no rights at all. We're going to pop them off as soon as we can. Well, you see, you're left with things. That's all. Now, notice the particular names of God that are used in Psalm 8. The first Lord, capital L, capital O, capital D, is the personal covenantal name for God. This is a particular name that was not used by the heathen. It was never applied to angels, to kings, to judges, or to men or demons. Never. It's probably pronounced Yahweh is perhaps the best pronunciation. The King James put capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, or on a few places put Jehovah, which is even a, a worse mistake. The important thing to understand, this is the personal name of God used in the context of his covenants. That is, God enters into a covenantal relationship with the elect in which we are chosen by the Father, purchased by the Son and sealed by the Spirit, blessed God, three in one. And this particular name is used, and then it's followed up with another name. O Yahweh, O Yahweh, our covenant God, our personal God with whom we walk, our Lord Adonai. It's in the plural. This is the word which in its root refers to pillar or strength. And it, it is the significance of God's sovereignty. God's sovereignty. So he says, O Yahweh, our Adonai. And there's a reason he used those different words. It's the blessed thought that the God we worship who is our covenant God, the one who ordained to come and to save us is not a pipsqueak deity of the mountains. It went, oh, Yahweh, we know you're just a little God, finite, struggling, pitiful little thing but we help, we just come to you and hope you can do something. He says, oh, our covenant God, you are the sovereign Lord of the universe. 
That's what that ad, our Adonai, our personal God is the sovereign Lord of the universe. The whole universe depends upon the sovereign rule of the Creator. Thus, we're not worshiping and following some weak, anemic little God like the open view of God to people, the process theologians who have a God who is inept, a God who cannot know the future, a God who blows it. In the words of Stephen Davis, his God can lie and his God can sin. Of course, I in the book said, yes, I believe your God can lie. Thankfully, he ain't mine. But you see, this is the point that he's saying, oh, our personal God, our covenantal God is Adonai, the sovereign Lord of the universe. Notice the blessedness of the words, our Lord. The heart of God's covenant with his elect is that they will be his people and he shall be their God. The covenant established a special relationship between God and them before the universe was created. Spurgeon has a very famous sermon. I'll recommend it. It's entitled, God's Shells and Wills. I'm going to get a seance up one of these days and call him up. I said, now Spurgeon, all them heathen, having back all these heathen... Why don't you come back and preach a sermon? He probably said, I'm going to preach shalls and wills. Because when you read the verses, you shall be my people. I will be your God, and you shall walk in my ways. Ooh, I love that. That's sovereignty. That's grace, where God says, I have determined that I am going to be your God, and there will be no other God for you. And you're going to be my people. Nobody can stop that. You are going to be my people. And thus, dear saint, understand that the Yahweh, who is your shepherd, is the sovereign Lord of the universe, and he's entered into a covenant in which he has decreed that he will be your God, and you will be his sons and daughters by grace. Now, God's name, notice the psalmist says, O oh, Yahweh, our Adonai. And I put an exclamation point. How excellent is your name. Now, throughout the Old Testament, God's name is a reference to his character. Names were reflective of human character, and thus Sarai became Sarah. Abram became Abraham. And Jacob, Yaqub, became Israel. Names meant something. And all of the names of God mean something. Every single one of them. It's a fascinating study to go into all of the different names for God. I view them as facets on the diamond of God's character. And as you take a large jewel that's fat and you turn it, the facets flash different colors of lights. Every facet is a different name for God. And you keep turning that in your hand. You say, oh, how excellent is your name in all the earth. Not only is God's glory revealed throughout the earth, but also in the heavens and above the heavens. For he says, how excellent is your name in all the earth. The heavens above display your glory. Does it matter if you're looking, and this is the human eye, you look at a flower. Or you look at the ear. One famous atheist looked at the ear on his infant daughter and said, there has to be a God. Chance would not have produced this. You can look at the, the world as a whole. There are too many factors that, that simply rule out a chance-caused universe. Or when you look up in the sky and you see the stars, tonight's a beautiful night, and you see the beauty of the heavens, you can see why the psalmist, he himself had been a shepherd. He had been spent many a night looking up. The heavens above display your glory. And then he says, listen, you must understand 
that all of creation reveals how majestic God is. The wonders of the universe from the smallest to the greatest aspect of creation magnifies the Lord. Now, children have no difficulty in understanding this whatsoever. Isn't that marvelous how our kids can pick this stuff up? Verse 2, out of the mouths of children and babies. Children have no difficulty in seeing the majesty of God in all the earth. They have confounded unbelieving adults many a time. Remember one little Salvation Army lassie sitting on the bus in Edinburgh? And an atheist came in and sat down and figured he'd have some fun, you know, with this little Salvation Army girl. He says, now, uh, you believe in God? Yes, sir. Is your God a big God or a little God? She said, well, he's big enough to create the whole universe, but small enough to live in my heart. Well, he didn't like that. <laughs> he said, well, you don't believe that Bible. I see you got a tambourine and a beer. You don't really believe in that. He said, yes. What about all those stories? Like, was it Elijah went up to heaven and all that, a fiery chair and all that world went? Yes. Do you really believe that? Yes. Well, what if you got to heaven? And Elijah wasn't there. She said, oh, sir, then you'd see him. <laughs> oh, I've seen kids do the darndest thing, and they can confound it. That's why in Matthew 21, the point of Matthew is while the adults missed the reality that Jesus was the Messiah, the kids didn't. They were shouting, Hosanna! to God in the highest. They knew who he was. They knew. And you see, children were very, very much involved in the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. They're children who believed in Jesus. They served as an example of faith and humility. He says, you've got to be a Christian and learn to live by faith like this kid here. He trusts me. Jesus welcomed children and blessed them. And when his disciples said, I like you're bugging the Lord, he says, no. I love kids. I believe Jesus had kids swarming all over him because they knew. They knew. No, do you take your children to Jesus every day? If you're a parent and you have kids in the home, if you're not praying with them, you're not taking them to Jesus to be blessed every day, shame on you. Shame on you. Do you take your kids to church so that as Jesus walks through in the midst of the congregation, remember the book of Revelation? Where was Jesus walking? In the midst of the candlesticks, in the midst of the churches. If you don't go to church, don't take your kids to church, Jesus ain't going to be walking by. I want as Jesus walks through the congregation, my children be there to touch the hem of his garment. They ha I'm going to put them in the way of Jesus and say, you ain't leaving here till you bless my kids. That's why family prayers and church attendance are very, very important because out of the mouths of babes, kids, God will reveal his will and his purposes. David now turns from the majesty of God to the magnitude of creation. Verse 3, when I look up to the heavens, to the works of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you established. Now remember, this was a shepherd boy grown up to become king. How many of you have ever gone camping? All right. There are no city lights. You just have a blanket and you're looking up. It's all inspiring. All inspiring. This is a, a shepherd boy. He used to look up all the time. To the works of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established. You see, this is the magnitude of creation, the magnitude of the universe. 
And this is set in opposition to the wonderful dignity of man. Since man and his world are so small compared to the rest of creation, man should have no importance. That is, if importance is on a scale from the biggest to the smallest. What would you conclude about man if he is viewed only in terms of his place in the magnitude of the universe? You know, having to study physics and quantum mechanics, having to go as a, as a philosopher, you have to go into all of that kind of stuff. Let me tell you, when you really begin to think about the vastness of the universe, it takes your breath away. This is a stupid little backwater piece of rock cir circling a third-rate sun in a backwater of the universe. And if it weren't for Scripture, and it worked that Jesus Christ actually came and proved by rising from the dead and a few other things, I would probably have to say if there is some kind of gigantic cosmic mind that created the universe, why in the world would he pay any attention to the, the viruses that infect this marble? That's you and me. I mean, we would be so small compared. Well, the, didn't Isaiah said it? If you took the whole world, it's nothing but dust on the scale. The scale wouldn't even move. We're just like dust. If you look at man in terms of the universe alone, you're going to end up with the humanist saying, it doesn't matter how you live or how you die because ultimately there's no meaning to human life. You're born, get out of life what you can get out of life, and it doesn't matter how many people you have to trample to get it, and then when you die, go out in the blaze of glory. That's the world. Why? Because man's dignity is not based on his place in the cosmos. This is where Carl Sagan is wrong. This is why the humanists have abandoned man as well as God. This is their failure. Despite the smallness of man in comparison to the magnitude of the cosmos, we are told that God is mindful of him. God actually is aware of our existence. And this is, just, this is a profound thought, people. Pantheists only believe that God is everything, meaning it. But it does not know that it exists. It does not aware of us. God is mindful of us. That, that blows my mind. God actually takes care. We read in the text... What is mortal man that you should take notice of his existence? You're busy running the solar furnaces we call suns. The comets are like yo-yos. You're keeping all the marbles moving in their orbits. And at the same time, you take notice of man or the son of man that you should visit him. How is it possible that you would come and take care? That's the word visit in the Hebrew here means God not only notices us, but he actually visits us and takes care of us. Despite the fact that there are other life forms in the cosmos which are superior to man. Did you know there are other life forms, other species, non-humanoid, sentient life forms? We call them angels, demons, devils, seraphim, cherubim, whatever. They are other life forms, sentient, with intelligence and, and will and purpose. And we don't know what else may be crawling around some rock, some other place. We don't know. It wouldn't surprise me. The God who created giraffes, you know, when he was making giraffes, this little thing, and he says, this would be funny. He goes, <laughs> and moved the, the neck up. 
then he's doing an elephant and he gets a, a bit of humor and laughs and puts a little kind of tail on him. I mean, this, the God who created this universe, big sense of humor, who knows what sorts of crazy things are out there. But the point is this, despite the fact there are other life forms, the angels, if nothing else, God has crowned man with glory. Look what it, glory, look, although you made him less than divine, less than God, you crowned him with glory and honor. You gave man dominion over the works of your hands. You put all things under his feet. This is, this is mind-blowing. David thought about those flocks. He thought about the birds. It, he says, you know, we can take a puppy, wild animal, and that thing end up sleeping with you in your bed and giving you kisses, and that little baby doggy love you. You can have a lamb become a member of the family. If you, you check your biblical scriptures, you'll see there was a story of a man, all he had was a little lamb. Grew up in his home, ate with the, ch even ate at the table, it says. You see, how can this be? God put these animals under our feet, means under dominion. And then he lists them, sheep and cattle, all of them, wild creatures of the field, birds. What is it? We like birds. We put them in cages. If you think about it, why do we have birds in cages? Whistling, talking, hello, hello, you know. <laughs> had a friend, had a parrot, 150 years old. The poor thing has been in a cage for 150 years. I, boy, I think this poor thing. But in the wild, a cat, I guess, would have eaten them long before. Fish, all that swims in the currents. You see, man, in terms of creation, in terms of God, you see, has dignity. Now, it's clearly man at creation before the fall is clearly in view when God said, take dominion. Only the existence of God gives dignity to man. Once you get rid of God, there is no dignity. Now, Psalm 8 is not just about man per se. And this is one of the sad things that led me to decide the best way to begin this series on biblical anthropology is to do a little bit of exegesis and preach on Psalm 8. Because I have been reading every single Christian work on anthropology I could find, and almost without exception, they talk about man in the abstract. Man in relationship to animals. Man in relationship to the machine. But they do not begin with man in relationship to God. They do not set the proper framework of man in the context of creation, fall, and redemption. And you see, instead of discussing man per se, Psalm 8 goes beyond Adam to focus on Jesus Christ, who was the ultimate man. Man of very man, says the confession. The children sang of the glory of Christ. At his incarnation, the Lord Jesus Christ, for a little while, became lower than the angels. He became the second Adam, and he was and is always and will always will be man of very man. That's why even as the mediator, he is the man, Christ Jesus, the theanthropic person who is our Savior and our Redeemer. He's God of very God, but also man of very man. Psalm 8 describes the dignity and glory of man because of what Christ is in his dignity, in his person, and in his work. What he is, Adam was, and we shall be in terms of a perfected, sinless humanity. We'll never be gods. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that we will ultimately be conformed to the image of Christ. And man qua man will once again be perfect in the image of God. In closing, would you notice verse 9? Oh, Yahweh, 
our Adonai, my Adonai. How excellent is your name in all the earth. As we begin to look at the whole subject of the nature of man, we're going to begin with the assumption that unless you begin with special revelation, you will never understand the true view of mankind. If you try to begin with human reason, experience, feelings, faith, if you try to begin with man as the measure of man, you will end up nowhere. God is the measure of all things, including who we are. Without God, we do not have a key to the riddles of life. Where did we come from? What are we? Why are we here? And where are we going? God is the key that unlocks the mysteries and the riddles that has, well, they've plagued man for millenniums. And it is only through the special revelation in Scripture and in Christ that we can come to an understanding of who we are and we can have dignity, worth, meaning, significance, and purpose. I leave you with the first question of the Westminster Catechism. What is the chief purpose of man? To glorify God and to enjoy yourself while you're doing that. Because in his presence there is fullness of joy. And at his right hand there are pleasures forevermore.